Hi class, today we're going to be talking about the dairy cattle industry to give you some background that you will need for your dairy cattle breeds. So we're going to talk about first what the general life cycle of a dairy cow is. When they are first born, they are separated from their mother, usually after about 24 hours. And that's because their immune system is really weak at that point. And if you were to keep them with the herd, a lot of the, the calves would ju just not make it because they couldn't fight off the kind of pathogens that they'd be introduced to. So they do live separately, but they are continued to be fed milk. Um, and they're weaned at six to eight weeks, just about like what a beef calf would be. Um, the bull calves are usually castrated and they're either used for veal production or a lot of them will be raised as steer and used for beef production. Heifer calves are put out to pasture until they reach maturity and they are gradually introduced to larger and larger groups of animals their own age. So they are all kind of hanging out together. They'll reach maturity at about 15 months. And then at that point, they are ready to be bred. Um, so after their first breeding, it's a nine to 10 month gestation. Usually with the first birth, it can be up, they can be around 24 months old. So about two years old um, when they actually give birth. And after that gestation period, they'll give birth. That's the act of parturition. And at that point, they will be milked for 10 to 14 months. They have to be milked two to three times a day, seven days a week. There's no such thing as being able to skip a milking. It's very painful for the cow if you do that, um, and it's really not healthy for them. So they need to be real, milked on a normal schedule, um, and you'll find that most of them really like it, and they'll come right into the milking parlor on their own. About three to four months into their milking period, the cow is then bred again. Um, and that is so that you don't have too much downtime and they are able to, again, get pregnant and kind of start the cycle over. You do want to allow a drying off period, usually about 60 days, where they will be done milking and then they'll kind of hang out in the field again. And that drying off period really helps improve milk production. The average dairy cow can then go through anywhere between two and five lactation cycles. So usually they will keep milking until somewhere between four and seven years old, but some can go much, much later than that. And that also depends on the breed. Eventually what happens is the suspensory ligament that holds the udder up starts to break down. And then once that udder falls because the ligament's no longer holding it together, they're no longer able to milk. And unfortunately then they have to be called. Um, they are called because basically they cost more to feed and care for at that point than the price of the milk that they produce, and that makes room for younger and better producers. So now that you know a little bit more about how they actually go through this milking process, we're going to talk a little bit more about the milk itself. So milk comes in two major grades, um, and every single batch of milk that's picked up at the producer will receive one of these grades. So grade A is what we sell as fluid milk, so the milk that you buy, the 1%, the skim, whatever it is at the store, and cream. And for grade A milk, facilities have to meet really stringent safety regulations. Um, it's amazing the amount of tests that milk goes through to make sure that it is safe to drink. Grade A, for that reason, can usually be priced higher, but it also costs more to produce. Um, and 98% of the milk that is produced in the U.S. is grade A. There's also a second type of milk called grade B or manufacturing milk. And that is what usually gets processed into cheese, butter, powdered milk, and other dairy products. Since that processing is a lot of times going to involve heating it up or other methods of decontamination, the regulations aren't quite as strict on the milk that's going to be grade B, but it's also not as profitable. So a lot of U.S. farmers think it's not worth it, and a lot of our milk that is grade B and goes into those products actually comes from other countries. So when you actually get the milk from the cow, it isn't all blended together like you buy in the store. Raw milk actually separates out into two different layers. And it's just like if you've ever had salad dressing that you have to shake up because the oil is floating on top of the rest of the salad dressing, same idea. All of the fat winds up settling up at the top and that's called the cream line. 
and then the other portion that does not have fat in it settles down below. So naturally, this is how your milk would come. And you can buy milk this way. It's called cream line milk when you do that. So most people do not buy their milk as cream line milk. They buy it as whole or reduced fat or skim milk. Um, and there's a couple processes that it has to go through to get to that, um, basically that state that you're gonna buy it in the store. Um, so one thing that I want you to realize with whole milk, it doesn't mean it's like 100% fat. That's like 3.25% fat and then you can kind of compare that to two percent reduced fat and one percent um, and then skim of course has no fat in it at all so one of the major process that you need to go through in order to um, mix all the milk together is called homogenization and basically in this cream line milk you have these giant globules of fat and you also have these proteins these casein molecules in there and this is what is separating out. You're getting the fat floating to the top and you're getting all of the protein and the water content going to the bottom. So what homogenization does is it mixes up the milk and it forces it through tiny little holes under high pressure. And by doing that, it breaks up these fat globules so that they're really tiny in comparison and it mixes them up with the acasein molecule and it forms these tiny little bits instead that are all suspended in the liquid and it all becomes the same consistency. So pretty much any milk that you buy at the store has been homogenized except for skim milk. And of course, the reason that skim milk is not homogenized is it has no fat in it. So you take the fat off first, then you don't have to break down the fat globules through that homogenization process. So this is kind of the whole process um, starting at the dairy for how milk gets to you. That raw milk from the dairy will be tested. It'll make sure that it doesn't have any antibiotics in it. It doesn't have any um, contamination of any kind. And then that raw milk will be either go off to be made into something like cheese or butter, or it will be separated. And when it's separated, the skim milk will come out and be um, separated from the cream. So then they can sell the cream as is, or they can blend it back with milk to make half and half, and that kind of thing. Um, or if it is being sold as 2% or whole milk or 1%, then it may have vitamins added to it first, and they are going to then homogenize it. And sometimes they will do that, but they'll usually do that after pasteurization, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, so pasteurization is going to kill any possible bacteria or anything that made it into the milk, although it really shouldn't have from the testing in the first place. Then homogenization will mix it all up, get it the same consistency, and at that point it will either be put into bottles or it will undergo further processing to make dairy products. So let's talk a little bit more about pasteurization. So pasteurization is basically a process of raising the temperature of the milk to a high temperature, um, and that will kill off any bacteria or any kind of pathogens that are in the milk so that it definitely is safe to drink. So pasteurization works because it actually rearranges the structure of the proteins in the bacteria's enzymes. And enzymes kind of help the bacteria survive. So by denaturing those enzymes or making them fall apart, they can no longer work, which means the bacteria is essentially dead at that point. There's different types of pasteurization. Um, it can be done at low and high temperatures, or it can be ultra pasteurization where it's at a, done at a very high temperature. The higher the temperature, the less amount of time you have to keep it at that temperature. Um, so there are advantages to that. However, some things um, won't work with ultra pasteurized milk. Like you can't actually make cheese with that ultra pasteurized milk because the proteins in the milk itself have actually fallen apart at that point. But the upside of that really high temperature pasteurization is you get a much longer shelf life. So if it's for fluid milk that people are going to drink, sometimes that is the best way to go. It's certainly one of the more efficient ways, and then that milk will last longer. And there are even shelf-stable milks that are made that way. Um, lastly, before we get into breeds, one of the things that you're gonna notice is that dairy cows are shaped a lot differently than beef cattle. Whereas the beef cattle had that nice square 
um, shape to maximize their muscling, the dairy cow is more uh, triangular. And that is because we want all of that energy to go into milk production. So they have been bred um, to purposely ha really have a great metabolism that maintains their body condition and puts a lot of nutrients into the milk. They show when they are in heat so that we know when to breed them. Um, they're really good at calving, so they tend to have very wide hips and that helps with the whole calving process. They're resistant to infections like mastitis that can contaminate the milk and eventually really hurt the cow as well. Um, they're built so that they're not as likely to get injured and able to walk and stand comfortably with rare needs for, for hoof trims or anything like that. And of course, for high milk yields, um, we want them to have the correct composition in their milk of the amount of butter fat and things like that that we want. We want them to be inexpensive to feed and have low maintenance costs. So those are all of the things that have gone into breeding these dairy cows. And you're gonna see some of those come up as we talk about your breeds, some of those characteristics that they originally tried to make that breed fit the best. So when you have a chance, go on over to your Breed ID Notebook and just open up your breeds for the week and we'll get started talking about what those 10 breeds are that we're going to focus on.